So when I consider humanity, all I can think about is amazing potential. Even a single human being, when they're born, their brain is like a chaos engine. It's capable of becoming anything based on what stimulus sprinkles down upon it. Being a high school teacher is an amazing experience because I get to see young people realizing their potential, making decisions and forging their own path. I love being a teacher. I love my job. Funny thing about growing up, though, is that it's been done billions of times before. It's very well documented, but when it's you, it's for the first time. It always feels like where no one's gone before. Even though we sometimes, if we're lucky, have so many grown-ups in our lives, grown-ups at home, grown-ups at school, to give us advice and share their experiences, we still seem to have to figure stuff out for ourselves. Here are some grown-ups. Trekkies, Star Trek fans. I was in Germany a few years ago for a scientific conference back when I was working uh, as a scientist. And I had a bit of a revelation about Trekkies. I happened at the time to watch a movie, Star Trek. And it was Star Trek First Contact. That's the one that kind of explains it. And I thought to myself, oh, wait, I kind of get this now. Because maybe your first reflex is, why do fully grown adults, many of which mostly educated, dress up as space monsters and space captains and get together just to compare their costumes? Well, I, I guess they're just nerds. But that's a label that doesn't mean anything. I feel like I actually figured it out. See, the, the Star Trek backstory is actually quite grim. It's post-apocalyptic. It's basically us, except in a century or so, we pretty much destroy ourselves with nuclear war. There's a group of scientists who, even though infrastructure is completely destroyed, they're still enthusiastic, and one of them had an idea. I think I could build a warp drive, something that's capable of making its travel faster than the speed of light. So they scavenged together resources. They found like an old ICBM, and they hollowed out the nuke part and put in a little capsule. They launched into space, and bam! Light speed. They did it. And they came back and partied. Funny coincidence about that moment, though, because there was a, a Vulcan scout ship. Vulcans, pointy ears. They were nearby, probably a few light years away, and they noticed. Because remember, the Vulcans are cruising around a galaxy teeming with new civilizations who are popping up all over the place, all full of potential and wonder in themselves. And there they are going down the roller decks as they're cruising along. Oh, yes, the tentacle monster people. Ah, oh, yeah, they're interesting. Cool biosphere, purple sky. Yeah, but they're starting to pollute the place. That's going to run away with itself. They'll be dead in a couple of decades. Cruise along a little bit further. Come down the little roller decks. The humans! Oh, they're so dead. I'm not saying, I'm not saying the Vulcans are big meanies or anything, but they need some kind of emotional coping mechanism. Seeing so much potential spread throughout the galaxy and watching it always just fade away. But then one of them, I guess at the radar or something, is like, uh, sir, I'm, I'm picking something up, an unregistered hyperspace window, I guess he would have said. And they all crowd around, they're looking, is it the Romulans? Is it the Klingons? Wait, is that the humans? How do they do that? And they change their mind about us. Maybe there is something special about these humans if they figured that out. Maybe we are worth something. And I thought, oh, wow, I'm starting to get the picture now. Because then they came down, partied with the scientists. Human beings become, became part of the Federation. Technology skyrocketed, infrastructure built up. Nobody wanted for anything. Everyone's job is just to be the best version of themselves that they can be. That's what Trekkies are doing. That's what Star Trek fans are. They're hopeful. They're hopeful for an amazing future for our race. But, you know, movies, they love the last-minute save. It's the three-pointer at the last second in a TV series where you defuse a bomb with one second left. But this is real life. We're gaining an unbelievable amount of power, and I don't feel like it's going to work to just hope that a, uh, an alien civilization comes and saves us. We might have to figure that one out for ourselves. See, it seems technology is easy. We're great at technology. We're actually quite clever building infrastructure too. Seems like being human is really hard. 
Even in my year nine classes, I so often think, I don't think they're finding the content as hard as they are finding being 14. You know what's great though? Fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are awesome! We've been having a blast of a time! Suddenly we're driving around in cars and trains and there's people flying in the air, there's people in space! We've got this whole amazing infrastructure built on the energy of fossil fuels. If we're a young civilization who is slowly finding an adult and mature responsible position in the galaxy, fossil fuels are like our allowance. It's as if Mother Nature, the physical embodiment of our mother, has just given us an allowance. She might not be very good for life advice. I'm not hearing the Earth explaining how we should live as humans very often. She sure is good for a bit of cash, a bit of energy. But as the great philosopher Homer Simpson once remarked, when pressed by his kids, what was that promise you always made for us? Uh, when you're 18, you're out the door. Fossil fuels are going to run out or start to cause so much damage that we have to stop using them. What are we going to do then? We have to grow up. Instead of just using the resources that we have in our family unit in our, on our planet, we have to start getting energy from the sun, the actual source, the sun. So that's solar and wind and all that kind of stuff. What's really good about those energy sources is they're actually environmentally friendly, right? Yay, the environment! Any environment fans out there? Look, green natural trees. Wait, why are we trying to save the environment again? I feel like that's just something people say. I mean, I guess it's, it's complex and it's interesting. Um, there's a lot going on there. You know what else is a really, really amazing environment? <coughs> Venus. Venus is cool! Look at that! We actually landed something on there. That's the kind of space probe that as it's taking footage, it's kind of tilting over. Because Venus will kill you three times before you hit the ground. Crush you with its pressure. Dissolve you with its acid. And melt you with its heat. But Venus is amazing. This is still just a rock floating through space. It's not even the closest planet to the sun, and it's the hottest. It can maintain tem temperatures of over 400 degrees Celsius on the shade side, in the dark. That's amazing. Any Venus fans out there? <laughs> still some Venus fans, that's good, that's good. Basically, we like the environment because we have to live here. The Earth is our home that we have to look after because we're here. It doesn't have any intrinsic value beyond that. The Earth is actually not trying to look after us. The Earth kills species on it willy-nilly all over the place. It's had oxygen levels way higher than this, oxygen levels way lower than this. It's had temperatures higher and lower. It's had massive ice ages, all kinds of mass extinction events. If the environment suddenly changes, it won't be the Earth looking after us, we'll actually be in trouble. Which is funny, because then it makes me think about all of this global warming type stuff and the climate change, and it all gets so politicized, but I feel like I can tell you two direct things that are just definitely true about global warming and climate change. No controversy, no, oh, we'll have to check and research it. First one, you know, let me know if this seems right. They say that climate change uh, is anthropogenic means it's caused by humans. Uh, and then there's controversy whether that's true. Um, question, is it better if it's caused by humans or is it worse? It's way better if it's caused by us because if it's caused by us, it means we actually have the power to change the weather. If it's not caused by us, right now we're doing everything that scientists would think would increase the temperature and it's doing nothing. Which means if we actually need to increase the temperature, we're powerless. It's way better if it's us. 1816, the year without a summer. Suddenly there was this volcano, Tambora, in Indonesia. And Europe had a massive famine. People died. That wasn't the Earth looking after us. That was a thing that happened that we were powerless to stop. And we need that power. If we decide that solar panels and... Wind isn't quite doing it for us anymore, if it's not quite powerful enough, if we've got bigger aspirations, well, that's when just getting the light from the sun needs to be magnified. We'll build our own sun. So this is the joint European Taurus, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, fusion reactor in the world. This one's actually about to get superseded by ITER. I was so excited about ITER when I was a 
young physics student over a decade ago, it's going to be a fusion reactor so powerful that it'll demonstrate that you can actually power the world on fusion. It stands for the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. I think they did some focus groups on that and decided that it wasn't really a good thing to include the word thermonuclear alongside the word experimental. <laughs> so they just call it ITER now. Although that's pretty handy, probably by coincidence, because ITER in Latin actually means like journey or path or something like that. That's good. We can hold on to that. That's kind of what this talks about. Yes, ITER! Now, what's amazing about fusion is it actually really isn't that dangerous. If a fusion reactor stops working, it just conks out. If fission stops working, that's where it's Chernobyl and it's all going horribly wrong. It's hard enough to get fusion to work in the first place. And if it gets hit by a tsunami, well, there's nothing in there. It's an empty space where you do a big plasma reaction. There's nothing to wash away. It doesn't have radioactive waste. So let's picture it. Suddenly, we've got massive fusion reactor, one on every continent, energy starts to become outrageously limitless. Can our society even cope with that? If suddenly you're plugging so much power into anything with technology and infrastructure and, and artificial intelligence, we're going to accelerate to a point where most of the people don't have a job because there aren't any jobs. If robots powered by virtually infinite energy are doing everything, well, now we're kind of really excited and really terrified at the same time because we're starting to get towards the Star Trek area, but what if all the people who own the fusion reactors have all of the resources? That's more than enough for every single human being on the planet to live way above the poverty line. But they can't get it because they can't get a job. We need an economic system that can handle that. I imagine if the Vulcans visited during 1929, Great Depression, they might not even be able to figure out what went wrong. I had it explained to me at some point that they'd just be looking down and there's the Great Depression, there's the people, there's the factories. No one's doing it. This is not happening. Everyone's starving and no one's feeding themselves. It wouldn't really be clear that it was an economic crisis because nothing was broken. We need to take control of that. And if we build massive power stations, that's the signal of a huge new revolution in what it is to be human. As another great philosopher once said, with great power station comes great responsibility. <laughs> oh, wait, I think I said that wrong. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. That's what it was. Actually, I think that was from Spider-Man. <laughs> Uncle Ben, there you go, great philosopher Uncle Ben. With great power comes great responsibility. But our great power doesn't just extend to our big power stations that are coming up. What about something like this? Mosquito. Most dangerous animal in the world, most deaths per year, malaria. Just the other day, a student in my form class said, hey, sir, look at this. It's that CRISPR-Cas9 thing that you love. And they were talking about modifying embryos. This is an extremely accurate genetic engineering tool that's basically been stolen from prokaryotic bacteria. What if, for argument's sake, I get the impression they can do it now, but soon... You made an army of male mosquitoes and they were all immune to malaria because you changed their genetic code, put in a gene drive, you forced them out onto the world's population of mosquitoes and in no time none of them can carry malaria. So does that mean that every single scientist who's working at a lab that can do that, who isn't breaking into that lab and releasing those mosquitoes, are they all guilty of manslaughter? I mean thousands of people are dying every year and they can, you can't just walk past someone and not save them, that's a crime. Kind of weird, right? Having so much power is giving us more responsibility, more moral responsibility than we've ever had to handle before. Because normally it's all acts of God. This tornado or this happened or that happened. What happens when virtually everything really is our fault? Because we can do something to save it. That's exciting and terrifying all at once. So no, they're not guilty of manslaughter. They're making a conscious choice that they don't know what that's going to do. That could make a malaria strain that's way worse. It could do anything to the ecosystem. That's where humans have to say, I am letting people die on purpose because it's a moral dilemma and that's the right choice. That's what a grown-up says. Not, oh, not my problem, I can't do anything. Ugh. That's what our history has had the luxury of. Oh, yes, cane toad. 
Look at him. Look how disapproving he is. Look at his big frowny face. So here in Queensland, we have cane toads. A previous experiment where we tested to see if we could meddle with the environment to make it better. That one didn't really work out. Turns out they're not interested in eating what we wanted them to eat, and now we have cane toads. But this kind of thing shouldn't deter us. We just need to get better at it. It's really, really tough because the environment's so complicated. You bring in something new, you analyze the hell out of it, and then, okay, we release it and we're going to have to see. Because there was this really great building material. It was like fireproof and it was soundproof and really cheap. One of the American states even had the ore as their state rock. Oh, and then it turned out it was asbestos. Ah, that's no good. How could we see that coming? That's so specific. This tiny little specific interaction it can do with this part of the biosphere that happens to physically be us. We couldn't see that coming. So now we're checking everything. We're checking the water, we're checking the animals, we're checking the biosphere. Okay, great. We've got a new thing. Propellants, refrigerants. Only a little bit toxic, but that's okay. All right, we're ready to go. Oh, it's CFCs. Oh, the ozone layer. Oh, God, we forgot the ozone layer. Suddenly it's doing this photochemical reaction, tearing the ozone layer up. How could you have ever expected that? So it is going to be difficult, but it is a moral dilemma. We will have so much power that we can't just ignore it. It will be our fault either way. So as we take this mentality and turn our eyes towards the stars, this is the Milky Way galaxy. Well, it's not, actually, because we wouldn't be able to see that. That's uh, if one of the furthest spaceships we've ever sent have only got like less than a pixel on that image. This looks like the Milky Way galaxy, so let's pretend. Imagine that you have a new civilization that pops up here, and they start emitting radio waves, like we have. Some time goes past, if we start the clock, those radio waves are expanding out, but now they're hollow on the inside. There's only 2,000 light years of thickness. Ooh, that means they're already dead. That's not bad, though. 2,000 years of emitting radio waves before they destroy themselves, that's probably pretty good. By the Vulcan standards, they'd be thinking, good work, guys. And then that continues to expand and propagate throughout the galaxy as the years go on. Very, very rough, rough estimates, by the way. Oh, look, there's another intelligent civilization. Ooh, that's much thinner. Oh, that's us. 400 light years. We're currently on like 70 or something of emitting power, powerful radio waves. So that would be our shell thickness if we, if we only lasted 400 years. Those two signals will expand. Their whole history will wash over our dead planet at this point. Our 400 years of most modern history washes over theirs. And those two signals just expand into nothingness. But what if we really got it together, became a real grown-up civilization, made good responsible choices, understood the natural world and were able to control it? Suddenly we have a home world, the Earth, and all of our history and everything that we are expands throughout the galaxy, filling up everything that we believe in. Everything that we believe in is the whole galaxy now. And then one day in our far future we might discover a new civilization just on the edge of existence, maybe running through similar problems we're having right now. And maybe at that point, we might be the ones to save them. Thank you. <laughs>